So, okay, so let's get started on the more fleshy content. So I'm going to talk about two things mainly. One is a very quick introduction to how plants work and the, only the bits we need to know really to be able to do things right. And then I'll, I'll uh, lay out five principles that we want to follow in whatever we do in gardening if we want to make sure that it's regenerative. And I'll come back to what regenerative means in a minute. Uh, so what does a plant need to thrive? What do our plants need? Water, sunlight, yeah. Anything else? Nutrients, yeah. We've forgotten the most important thing. Love, Love that's important, definitely. <laughs> so plants are made of, and we are made of, something carbon. Yeah, of carbon, <laughs> which comes from the air. Now plants and humans are made of air, in, in a way. Um, and that air actually comes from the sun you know, at the beginning, but it's, um, it's there where the, this hard substance is made of air, believe it or not. And that fixation, that idea of bringing that air into something solid happens via plants and via a process called photosynthesis which needs as you've said sunlight water and co2 all the energy on the uh, energy on this planet comes from the sun i mean some of it comes from the interior of the earth but that doesn't apply to our case some you know most of it will come from the sun and that's the powerhouse of our systems and so we need to make sure that this first step through which air and sunlight come into being a living thing is done properly and plants can only do it if there are nutrients as some of you have said in the ground and those nutrients come in a different in different types of forms minerals and there's up to you know people believe 14 to 17 that plants need or use in a form or another and so in order for photosynthesis to happen those minerals need to be there uh, in the right amounts and they come from the soil so if you have a look at this uh, the only thing that comes from the soil so far is minerals and water to an extent which you know will come from the soil even though it goes in the soil via the via the rain um, then what happens is photosynthesis will send will produce sugars from all these things that go into the plant via the leaves and via the roots and these sugars are then packages of energies energy that can be sent to the plant by the plant wherever they need it to do whatever job the plant needs to do uh, and uh, some of it will be converted into energy and that process of converting sugar into energy is called respiration and we all do it every living cell on this planet does it in a form or another and it requires res respiration requires oxygen so that's where you need the other component one of the other components of the air and because every cell does it you don't only need it above ground you only need you also need it near the roots because the roots also do respiration those sugars go to the roots and they need to be converted into energy for the roots to grow harvest nutrients and do their job um, and so oxygen needs to be near the roots, which is something we always forget. It's actually one of the most important things we do in agriculture is managing oxygen. Oxygen is the most abundant element on this planet. We are mostly made of oxygen. We're told we're made of water, but in that water there's oxygen, H2O. So we're mostly made of oxygen. So it's important we manage that oxygen very well, otherwise things do die. Um, when a plant is doing those two things, photosynthesis and respiration well, I put that halo to signify it's a healthy plant. Uh, that doesn't mean it's expressing its full potential. It just means it's surviving and, you know, not dying and, and resisting some, some element of stress, but not a lot. So how do we provide those things in conventional agriculture? Um, in that box, I've put all the things we, we do, well, we don't do, but people do in conventional agriculture to make sure that this picture functions as we believe it should. So people will provide sunlight, CO2 and water by... Um, killing all competition by weeds or pests, so using pesticides, herbicides, and water is provided via irrigation, which sometimes is done very inconsiderately, and so you deplete the water table, or you, um, you undermine your supply of water in the long term. And then usually what gets done in terms of improving soil structure and allowing water and air to be available to roots is tillage. So the ground gets turned over um, broken into very small bits and uh, becomes nice and soft which some some of us have come to believe it's a good thing and I'll try to convince you that it's not um, for many reasons um, and so finally for minerals and soil fertility what people do usually is use fertilizers and that includes um, organic fertilizers in organic agriculture but there's still inputs that come from outside the farm in a form or another in some cases they're synthetic like the pesticides that get used so they're made in a factory by human processes and human machines and human chemical um, labs and in some cases they come from uh, the bottom of an animal or some organic process but they're still inputs um, so there are a lot of problems with that picture 
and hopefully, you know, if you're here, you don't need telling that. So if we do things that way, a lot of things go wrong. Plants in, in, in the long term don't respond to this very well. Soils don't respond to this very well. They degenerate and in time we can keep doing those things and every time we need to do it more and more and we have to come up with more costly and destructive solutions um, to, to make this um, carry on. And so um, there's an the reason for that is that there's an element in this picture that we've been underestimating. So we talked about uh, respiration and photosynthesis and how it depends on the chemistry in the soil and the chemistry in the leaf and the physics of the soil so how how uh, accessible it is to oxygen uh, and uh, and water but we haven't talked about biology and that's a very important aspect of what happens in the soil so that's if you want the missing link that allows us to move away from that set of um, techniques which put us in the predicament we're in um, some people believe we only have 40 years left of harvest before things completely fall apart in our soils. Apart, this is you know, not even thinking about the climate getting worse. Um, and so we have to really attack that problem in a, in a systemic way. And so, yeah, what we've been missing is soil life. And when I say soil life, I mean on many levels. There's obviously big things that you can see with, the, with your eyes, like moles, voles, worms, um, beetles. Uh, uh, ants and there are things that you only see under a microscope uh, and those include um, you know bacteria fungi and other things we'll have a quick look at in a moment um, so I'm just going to give you a quick a quick review of how in some cases soil life can improve things without us doing anything which is quite revealing have you heard of mycorrhizal fungi before so some of you have what are they, are they good? Are they good for something? Yeah, they're quite accessible in that yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. so they, 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 uh, they are in, in wild ecosystems quite, quite uh, often, I mean always, if you really have a wild ecosystem. What they do is they associate with a plant at the root stage. Actually, when a plant is sending its first root out of the seed, they form a network around the root of the plant. They go into the plant and build this kind of uh, relationship with the plant and they exchange sugars because as we'll see in a moment the plants will share sugars with life in the soil and in exchange for those sugars that keep the fungus alive because the fungus can't get sugar from the air only plants can on this planet and some bacteria um, and so the sugar in exchange gives a lot of things like forms this network of nutrients that extends way more way way farther than any roots could possibly reach so the plant then suddenly is available has got a lot more nutrients available um, by virtue of having this extension of its roots that can go into every cranny of the soil kilometers away from the actual root system. Also, they, um, fungi in general and mycorrhizal as well do make humus, which is this amazing substance that can hold uh, its weight multiple times in nutrients and water. And it's what we want as a stable source of, uh, of habitat for soil life and food for soil life in the soil. And they are the only ones that do that very effectively um, by producing a thing called glomalin, which is a glue that keeps the, soil, keeps the soil together and so that these microbes can travel in that soil and the roots can penetrate it because it's soft enough, but still it's together. It's not uh, overly, uh, overly uh, separated. And yeah, go for so it. When I bash through my soil with my mattock, I'm wrecking it. Yeah, exactly. Because it's a network, it's very yeah. delicate and it's also very vulnerable to any mechanical disturbance. Um, while, you know, whether we do it with a, with a spade, with a fork, or, w or with a machine, it's even worse. Um, and so fungi is the most missing, the most important missing element in agricultural soils, and mostly because we just cultivate that soil with machines. And so, uh, you know, most agricultural soils have got zero, zero fungi or very little um, fungi. And, uh, you know, you can see here a few photos that show you. Some of them make fruits, so you can see porcini are an example in the forest, porcini mushrooms or... SEPs, I think you call them in this country, they, they are a mycorrhizal fruiting body. Most of them don't make a fruiting body, they just form a network in the ground that you're not able to see unless you dig in that soil. And, and if you look under the microscope, you'd see that within the cell of the root of the plant, there is a small tree. So the fungus sends kind of roots into the plant to exchange the nutrients from, from the outside. And it's been tested very many times in trees and, and even uh, crops like tomatoes that the effect of having mycorrhizal inoculation in the roots 
is impressive. You get yields improvements, you get a much stronger and vigorous plant root system, you get improvement in the soils as a result of having the plant grown, which is usually the opposite if you think. Agriculture has led us to believe that you grow plants and so you're impoverishing the soil, so you need to do something to compensate. But usually, in nature it doesn't work like that. Nature fixes soils and improves them by growing plants. And so that's also thanks to fungi. And so introducing those fungi back into the system will allow us to do a lot of things without lifting a hand. Because you know, our plants will have more water than we can possibly give them, more nutrients, and our soil will improve them. Uh, finally, I, I will say something very briefly. Fungi in the soil, especially mycorrhizal, will um, select good and bad microbes for us and the plants. So if there are pathogens in the soil, mycorrhizal, because they depend on the plant, um, they want to protect it from any, anything that can kill it. So they will kill or discourage any pathogens coming from the soil. And not only that, if plants are far apart and one plant gets attacked by a, by a parasite of any type, by an insect or something, via the soil network it can communicate to a, a plant which is farther away to put its defences up because something is coming its way. So plants can communicate via this network in very many ways that we still don't understand fully. Then we have bacteria. I won't spend much on bacteria. They're everywhere. They're inside us, on us, and they're the workforce of this, of this planet. Somebody said, if you don't like bacteria, you should change uh, planet because you know <laughs> they are the owners of this planet if you want um, and they are important because they convert the goodness in the air into nutrients for the plants the most important nutrient apart from carbon oxygen and hydrogen and the things that we made of is nitrogen especially because it makes protein amino, amino acids and then protein and plants are what makes that protein into something we can eat you know even the meat in animals is made by proteins that come eventually originally from a plant so plants can fix that nitrogen from the air which nothing else can put into solid food. Um, and the way they do that is by connecting with this bacteria called rhizobia or frankia. And if you've d dug up your broad beans or beans, sometimes you do see these nodules. And if you open them up and they're pinkish or reddish, it means that they've been getting nitrogen from the air and fixing it into uh, nitrogen for the soil and for the plant. And without that process, life wouldn't exist on this planet to the extent we know it. So bacteria are very important in many ways. Also, they do so many things, we would spend a whole day to list them all, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that too long. Um, and, so we have, and then we have bigger, anim bigger things, you know, what's called meso macrofauna, like worms that dig the soil for us, so we don't need to do any digging anymore. So the soil needs to be some, somewhat disturbed and oxygenated and, and, and mixed together, but we don't need to do it ourselves. If we have a good population of, of worms, and worms will eat nematodes, so they need microbes, so it's all connected. And then we have beetles and ants, and all these things are all very useful. So everything you see that's moving or alive in the soil, it's got a reason to be there. So there's no such a thing as a foe or a bad guy in that soil. Um, this forms what we sometimes call the soil food web because it's very complicated it's not just a chain things eat each other in a very funny ways and so it's kind of a complicated complex web and it allows us to replace those things that we say agriculture does which don't do any good to our soils uh, for example fungi and bacteria will do the digging and the oxygenation for us and will provide also minerals earthworms will do that digging for us as well the water will be provided by fungi in most scenarios if you have a no dig soil so a lot of the things that we provide to plants in destructive ways can be provided by somebody else so that we just stand, uh, you know, just stand back, have a look, and enjoy the system working on its own. Um, so we've added, if you want, another component to that picture that I had originally on the, on the screen. We've added all these guys, including uh, these interesting things called nematodes and protozoa, which are the eaters. These are actually the most important ones because they eat the bacteria and fungi and they are food for the earthworms. So they kind of link everything together. And, um, and they make this third process that we often forget, which is the interaction, the partnership within plant and soil life. So if these three things are working well, the plant is not only getting by, uh, but it's thriving and expressing its full potential. And that's the, what the halo there um, um, represents. And the plant, in order to maintain that system working, will sacrifice on average 25% of the sugars it makes. So, you know, imagine being, well, we, ca we kind of do it, we have a lot of microbes in our gut, and a lot of the food we eat actually feeds them and not us. And so um, we already do it, but plants do it a lot more efficiently than we do. They sacrifice up to 75% of the food they get for those microbes in the soil, because they need them and they rely on them. So, um, so by 
And doing that, uh, plants can then uh, develop a type of health which builds on levels. And one way I like to, um, to represent that is via this thing called the plant health pyramid, uh, which shows you what plants can uh, do when they have more and more of these uh, things that we talked about functioning right. So a plant that does successful photosynthesis is a plant that, that's a plant, it's functioning. And when plants are able to complete, to form complete proteins, is a nutritious plant that's also kind of um, working well within the first two processes that I talked about. Then when life in the soil is collaborating with the plant in an effective way, you get these two levels of higher health, if you want. And the plant is able to storage surplus energy. This will, always, will often be in the form of fats. So you know when you see on a plant very shiny leaves, that's a sign of fats or oils. That means that the plant not only is healthy, but it's got the ability of storing the extra health for later consumption. So it's a good sign. Um, and so it's good fats, not bad fats, if there's such a thing as bad fats, uh, which probably there isn't. And then finally, this is the holy grail of plant nutrition or plant growth. It's very technically called uh, plant secondary metabolites, but those are those things that we use for medicine and for um, um, more higher nutrition, if you want. So, you know, most me medicine before the advent of um, factory made ones were made from these things, you know, like aspirin and uh, most drugs were originally uh, made from these compounds that in plants appear and they're called caffeine or teen or uh, salicylic acid and all sorts of things that we use in herbal medicine or also for uh, tricking our body into thinking it's more awake than it is or hallucinogenic things. They all come from these properties that these compounds that plants make to protect themselves from pests mostly and then we've found ways to use them for our own um, for our own benefit and when when all this is working well not only are we cultivating plants that are very nutritious for us and very healthy but they also improve the soil and imp improve the climate you know if you are sensitive to that um, uh, that topic because obviously we don't want CO2 to go in the air for many reasons but from my point of view, the main one is that we want that carbon to be in the soil to be, become a habitat for soil life. Soil life will live somewhere, will eat something, and we need to provide that. And sh that stuff shouldn't be in the air, should be where it's needed in the soil. Um, so what do these guys need? Well, they need food and they need habitat. And they have a hierarchy of things they like, and that's very important. The first thing is what we call root exudates. That's a type of cake, if you want, that the, the plant gives to the microbes. It's made of sugars, proteins, carbs and other compounds and so it kind of is like a cake but it's important that it doesn't look like always the same you know our microbes don't want tiramisu every day they want different stuff and so that's important that, that it is important that we give different plants uh, in the same plot we plant different plants at the same time so that we can have a, a very complex patisserie uh, serving our microbes in the soil in the absence of those so if you don't have living roots the microbes will start eating dead plant roots so it's very important if we don't have live plants that we at least leave the dead roots in there because it's the sacred choice. In, you know, that missing, they will eat plant debris, mulch, organic things, compost, straw, hay, dead leaves, whatever we leave on the surface, and the worms pull down and then the microbes can break down. In the absence of that, they eat their own house. They eat what we call humus or organic matter, that thing in which they live and which gives them their last resort of food. Agricultural soils don't have this thing anymore because you know, they're, they, uh, uh, they're the soil is continually tilled and it stimulates another activity by soil microbes and they start eating whatever they've got. They're not provided enough living plants, dead roots and organic mat and uh, compost or straw or whatever. And so they start eating their own house until there's no house, there's no microbes and the soil is completely dead. So we don't want to get to that stage. At all costs we have to try and give them these three things. Um, the first one really is exudate. So if we don't have a living plant, we want a dead root. If we don't have a dead root, we want to give a very nice thick mulch on our soil. Okay. Uh, do, you know, do interrupt me if you want to ask questions about any of this. Um, so that's kind of completes the first bit that I wanted to talk about, which is the most theory dense. Uh, um, and so it, it's all about, if you don't want to take anything else home from this, is, you know, there are three things in a plant that need to work. And the first one is photosynthesis, the second one is respiration, and the third one is plant-microbe interaction. And the first one requires so, you know, soil that has nutrients, but especially sunlight. Sunlight is really what we are interested in. The second one requires oxygen, and the third one requires a live soil. So we don't disturb that soil, as we'll see in a minute, to keep it alive. From my perspective, you want to connect the soil health. Yes. 
Very good question. Different things. So first, first thing is, the obvious thing is counting how many worms you have. Second thing is look. No, not absolutely. Both of them are important, yeah. So in a system which is no dig, where you mulch the soil, you'll have a lot of composting worms like, you know, Asena, the ones that are red and pointy and, and surface dwelling. But then you also have the pinkish rounded ones which go very deep. You need both because one of them will bring fertility and life down and the other one will decompose that life at the surface. So the more diversity of anything that you can see, the better. So that's the second thing. The more diversity of life, if you see spiders, if you see um, any sort of critters, like small mites or small um, beetles, that's all good. Um, and then uh, the, the third thing would be the general, um, with your senses, you'll learn to differentiate between good and bad soil. And most of us already know without knowing what good soil should be like. It should smell, as you said, it should smell like forest floor. When you go in that leaf litter, so, you know, do do it when you go on a forest, in a forest. Uh, lift the, that leaf litter and get a little bit of the soil underneath and smell it. That's a smell that we are, we are wired to love uh, because there's some bacteria that produce geosmine and other things that work with our nervous system to, to communicate relaxation and, and well-being. So we love that. And if we can find it in our soil, that's a great sign. Another thing is fungal activity. Do we see any white mycelium? That's fantastic if we see that. And then the color, is it dark brown? Not necessarily black, that's not a great thing, but if it's dark brown rather than gray or red or, um, or greenish, which is not a good thing. Uh, and then how soft it is. So the deeper you go, the more compact it will be, but you'll still be able to um, break it apart with your hands into smaller crumbs. So I would say those are signs that your soil is alive without a microscope, without a microscope, yeah, yeah. And we'll try, I'll show you We'll compare some things outside that will give you a measure of that um, so we can see it in practice. So second part.